today, we have one of my favorite people, Wendy Malik, who's been on the EMA board for 20 years. And we're going to be having a conversation with Nada DeMeo, founder and president of the Return to Freedom Wild Horses Conservation, and Celeste Carlisle, a biologist and a science program, program manager at RTF on the importance of protecting wild horses and the impacts of climate change on their population. So first off, I just want to say thank you to Wendy for everything. She's been such an activist and such an amazing participant in saving the planet. And thank you for your passion on this topic and bringing awareness to this issue. I have to be honest, I am that person that didn't know that wild horses still existed until I went down the rabbit hole of this amazing organization. So let's dive in. I'm going to hand it over to you, Wendy. Thank you, Eric. Always a pleasure to share a screen with you. <laughs> Uh, about 20 years ago, at the last minute, a friend had an emergency and asked me to take her place hosting a fundraiser for a wild horse sanctuary. And like you and so many Americans, I didn't realize that we still had wild horses roaming the range. That day was the first of many that I would spend in their company, and it changed my life. Wild horses, often known as Mustangs, are living legends of the Wild West. They've been intricately woven into our history. Along with burrows, they were used for transport, for farming, mining. Uh, they delivered our mail, they fought our wars. And when they were replaced by vehicles and machines, many of them returned to freedom on some of the most remote ranges in the West. There are now an estimated 95,000 wild horses on our public lands and almost 50,000 in government holding facilities. Without a natural predator, their populations are growing and there's a serious fight over who and what should have access to the dwindling resources on the range. I really wanted to have this conversation to shed light on the current challenges facing these magnificent creatures and the work being done to find an effective and humane solution. <gasps> oh, they're beautiful. Look at that. By darting the mare with this mixture here, we're going to prevent pregnancy in that mare. And by reducing their population growth, we aim to keep them free. I wanted to create an environment where people could come and learn about the horses from the horses in nature's classroom. Netta, I want to talk to you first. You have devoted most of your adult life to this cause. Tell us how Return to Freedom was born. You know, um, basically when I was probably four, um, I started riding horses and my mother said horsey was my first word. And I, I just feel like I sort of came into life with a passion. I don't remember when I saw my first horse, but it was my first word. So by the time I was six, I was riding or four I was riding and at six, I saw something on television where uh, herds of wild horses were being chased and captured by cowboys. And I don't remember if it was news or a movie or what it was, but that was probably in 1966, aging myself here. But, you know, it was very, um, it, oh, I remember the feelings still today of standing there just being completely 
uh, frightened and scared that what, you know, where am I? Like, what kind of a planet is this? It really scared me. I remember being so angry. I looked at my parents and started yelling at them and said, when I grow up, I'm going to go all over the world and tell people the truth. And I'm going to have a place for these animals where they can be safe. Um, so that is really the beginning. Cause I, I think that, um, I like to say that a six-year-old started Return to Freedom uh, 37 years later. <laughs> and uh, um, I was living in Los Angeles and I was working in the film industry. I had studied uh, fashion design and fashion and I was working uh, with A-list actors mostly uh, on you know theater, film, uh, editorial, things like that. And my life was going through changes in the mid nineties. I was divorcing and um, looking at what do I really wanna do? I was seeing uh, the Associated Press was really exposing the issue. And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe what I was reading. Uh, there was a lot of corruption. Wild horses were being um, siphoned off uh, to slaughter. Um, and um, I was mortified. And like everybody else, I was sort of like, it reawakened, you know, the whole, um, the whole passion for uh, wild horses and to save them. Um, so I didn't really... I guess it went dormant. I didn't really, like everybody else, think that there were wild horses left and this sort of really brought it up. So I started investigating and researching and looking at what people were doing about it and uh, what wasn't being done about it. And the more I dove in, the more I saw that it was really a political issue. And that was really intimidating um, because it felt very hostile. And the more I, I looked at it, I, I, I thought, how can I make a difference? What value can I add? Uh, so I really wanted to understand what was happening. Um, and it, it, it's really a battle over the use of our public lands and um, the resources there. You know, the uh, forage for grazing and water for livestock is the biggest threat to the wild horses existence and has been. So it, it was a very hostile issue. Um, and it, it still is a very controversial and hostile issue. Although I feel like because the world is changing, I think, and there's more social media, there's more pressure on, on exposing and, uh, things and transparency. So things are moving, but they're moving very slowly. So I started Return to Freedom. I wanted it to be a solution focused organization. And I wanted to stay focused on solutions because these animals are so magnificent. And, and I thought, you know, if we can stay, if we can look at what isn't working on the range and what are the solutions to it, how can we, what do we need to do to bring awareness to the fact that A, we have wild horses in America, what they are, who they are, what they need and what's threatening their survival. Um, I, I believed that people could fall in love with them. And if people fall in love with them, they'll understand them. People understand them, they'll want to save them. And so that was the journey of why I put together an, um, an organization called Return to Freedom. And we focus on solutions. I knew we needed a sanctuary. A sanctuary, while it will not save all the horses, it creates a, a wonderful platform and venue for the public, especially children, to come and to learn uh, about America's Mustangs and the history of the horse in America. And so that's exactly what, what the sanctuary has, has been. It's been a, a, a beautiful place for uh, education. I knew that education was the key. Um, and we do have a sanctuary now with over 500 animals, uh, wild horses and burros. We have um, a vi very robust educational program with tours. Uh, we have a conservation program for threatened strains of the original Spanish horses that re-entered America in the 15 and 1600s. Um, they're pure and strain horses, the, the original Iberian strains that, that came here with early explorers. Um, you can hardly find them on public lands anymore because they're diluted with larger stock that arrived later. Um, so like the pure and strain Chata ponies that we have here, um, they go back to Hernando de Soto's time and they carried, um, by the 1800s, they were completely integrated into tribal cultures and they carried uh, the sick and the old and the infirmed on the trails of tears. And um, these horses sort of were the foundation of what we call the Spanish Mustang in America. And today the American Mustang is um, very diverse 
Um, they're horses that have interbred on our public uh, lands, on our vast uh, federal lands and state lands, <clears throat> and um, become the, the wild horses of today. So, so they um, represent horses that were used for, yeah. Netta, can I just um, ask you to just explain that a little bit better? Is, is Mustang a breed and, and what, what is the difference between a domestic horse and a wild horse? Yeah, um, I love that question. Um, we like to say Mustang is not breed, it's a lifestyle. And the reason is that the, um, a wild horse out there, um, you know, on our, on our Western landscapes, they're diverse breeds, all the interbred over the last few hundred years. So um, no, it is not a breed. It's commonly referred to as a breed, but it really is derived from the word Mustaño, which is Spanish for a horse without a home. So we, you know, that is where the word comes from. A wild horse, you know, is growing up in a herd environment and they have a certain etiquette and they educate their young, passing down information from generation to generation. They have a very sophisticated social structure and it's vital to their very survival. They're bonded, they're social mammals like we are. And um, so when they are captured, you know, they are forced into a domesticated environment that isn't even truly equine friendly for domestic horses. And so for me, um, you know, when I observe many of the equine facilities, um, they're not, they're not really designed for horses. They're designed for people. And the, the horse really truly lives in, they live in family harem bands. They raise their young. Young colts are raised and prepared to leave the harem band and then go off and start their own bands later. Uh, so in the middle of that, after they reach adolescence, they're pushed out. They join bachelor bands and some of them will be lucky enough when they're challenging stallions as they get older from everything they learn from their, from their father in the band of uh, through play, they are now prepared to battle other stallions and acquire mares and have a, um, you know their own family. So it's not really all that different um, from humans if you really think about it. And um, I think the instinctive nature of the horse goes back you know, 55 million years. So you've got a basic nature um, that predates humans, uh, you know, by many millions of years. And many, a lot of people don't realize that the horse originated in North America. This is the home of their origin. Uh, they traveled over the Bering Land Bridge over millions of years with woolly mammoths and many other animals that are now extinct, some that are not. And um, they went through many adaptations in a changing climate and over millions of years. Their last adaptation was in North America uh, to the one hooved horse we know today. We, and that genus is Equus cabias. So the horse that we know today originated here and it, it dispersed throughout the world um, and then returned um, again at, well, hang on, sorry. It, it disappeared after the last ice age. So they've been gone or they're believed to have been gone for the last, about, from about 10, 13,000 years ago, re-entering in the 1500s and the 1600s with early explorers. So even though they returned domesticated as they got loose or were set free, they returned to a natural state. Um, in some of the most inhospitable areas and the most remote areas of uh, the United States, the Rockies, the Great uh, Basin, and places like this. So the horses um, today, to me, they're wild. They've returned to a wild state. They're not, they survive very well without human control or interference. And in fact, um, <clears throat> um, roundups and captures are their greatest threat today. Um, because there are not a lot of large predators out there, or there certainly are not enough to manage their population. So um, really, they, they survive very well without human interference. So to me, they're um, wild, you know. And I know I, I've seen that firsthand, having adopted two of these wild horses from Return to yeah. And when I see them, 
next to the domestic horses that we had, domesticated ones, it's um, it's quite extraordinary the contrast. I love them all, but but the wild ones have a, a kind of curiosity and and also a strength and just their feet and their legs. It's uh, it's quite remarkable, and they yeah. tend to be self cleaning. It's very weird, but. They can roll in mud and the next day they look like it never happened. There's something um, far more self, self-sufficient self about them. And, um, and definitely a curiosity that, that doesn't exist in yeah. to that extent. Uh, really, really. Yeah, amazing. you know, and I, I and I see that and I and I look at it as these were horses, your horses that you've adopted you know, they grew up in a herd environment. So they were educated and from the day they were born by the matriarchs in the herd. It's a matriarchal society. Um, and they are, their their character is shaped, you know, from the, from the day they hit the ground and they have to learn to survive within the first few hours of their life. Um, and they may even have to get up and run from a predator if they're in the wild um, or a threat. So, um, they're definitely, their instincts are developed and they are, uh, yeah, I, I guess etiquette is the best way I can think. They learn herd etiquette. They, they're socialized um, by the herd. And um, it definitely, uh, my experience is similar to yours in that their instincts are just so acute and, and sharpened. And some are so sharp that it's really difficult for them to be domesticated. Yeah. Um, they're just very reactive. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I respect it. Yeah. Um, you were but, talking before about, um, well, this all is interwoven, but you know, you mentioned earlier, we were talking about slaughter. Um, the vast majority of Americans oppose horse slaughter. Um, and although it's not legal in this country, there are kill buyers who can take these horses who often are put up for sale uh, to Mexico and to Canada where slaughter is still is still taking place. What what do you think we can do to ensure their welfare and safety when it comes to horse slaughter? Like what's being done now? Right, well, you know, first of all, going back to 2007, 2007 the last slaughterhouse um, for horses was closed in, in the United States. Um, and the way we keep that closed in the United States is by er every year we work closely, we lobby hard um, to keep language in the budget bill and the appropriations bill to prevent tax dollars from being used to for uh, horse slaughterhouse inspections. So that's how we keep it, it closed. Um, however, the horses are still vulnerable, wild horses and domestic horses in America. Um, because until we have federal legislation that will prevent wild horses or domestic horses from being sold or transported uh, over our borders to Mexico or Canada for the purpose of slaughter. So the SAFE Act is legislation that is currently uh, up and we have been um, lobbying to have this bill passed for a few years now. Um, and that, it, that legislation does exactly what I just said. It will prevent the, the sale and transport of horses uh, for the purpose of slaughter. So they won't be able to uh, be sent to Canada um, or Mexico to be slaughtered. We don't eat meat in America. So, you know, the, these horses are butchered um, and then shipped to Asia and, and Europe. Right. So. I uh, actually took my niece, my niece's first um, lobbying effort when she was, I think, yeah. 10 years old, I took her to, to Washington and we were there lobbying on, uh, on behalf of the horses uh, for the SAFE Act, which seems to be coming around with every new administration, every new Congress, we have to go and fight it all over again. Yeah. So Although we are, it's, just, it's gaining um, some ground. I think I, I'm really hopeful that we'll be able to get it passed in 2022. So am I. So are we. So let's let's mm -hmm. let's ask you. Uh, as a biologist, you've been managing RTF's fertility control program since what two thousand five, mm -hmm. is that right? And I love I love this line in your bio. One foot is squarely planted in the world of science, and the other in the world of horse conservation. How do you balance the two? <laughs> um. 
sometimes I don't balance it so well, frankly. It's it's a it's a difficult position because of the kind of noise around this issue. Um, so my background in science and my appreciation of science in helping to guide us towards solutions that are uh, logical and reasonable, um, coupled with um, horses are a part of the American landscape. Um, there's an act that protects them. Um, they're incredibly important to people in this country for lots of different reasons. Um, and walking that line between really looking at what's occurring and projecting out what could occur uh, with a robust and holistic management approach. And, and when I say holistic, I don't mean it um, in some airy fairy way. I mean it in that you have to look down the line at your consequences with each action that you take. Um, and you have to take into account all of the systems, including the ecosystem, obviously, around those actions. And thinking about how science can responsibly drive policy uh, can, can be perceived as being pretty square. <laughs> I, think, um, I think Netta and I do a good job of balancing each other with, with Netta being the passionate driver and me sitting there going, well, if we analyze these numbers, this is what needs to happen. <laughs> and, and in reality, we need to be somewhere in the center because our public lands are managed for multi-use and that is not a perfect system. And in fact, I would argue that we haven't done a great job setting up that system, uh, even in a healthy scientific manner. Those different uses on that public lands, um, they're not all natural, I guess I would, I would say. Uh, they weren't there before we were, uh, but we are here and we impact our environment. And so trying to dig into where science helps to drive policy and dig into that with, with that foot squarely planted and being thoughtful and humane and that welfare is incredibly important, not only to those horses out there, but to, to everything that's out there. Um, it's a tightrope for sure. Yeah. yeah. Netta was talking before about uh, overpopulation, which is this huge giant question. How do we do this? There's, <laughs> there is such a, a an ethical and political controversy over roundups and holding facilities, euthanasia versus fertility control on the range. Um, to keep herds at a viable number, what what can be done in in the most in the most humane way? What 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 are you hoping for? Um, well, when we look at Words like, I think the word overpopulation has become a charged word in the, within this issue. And if we step back and take a deep breath and think about things in terms of carrying capacity. So what can an ecosystem tolerate? What uses are we as humans asking of that ecosystem that are going to keep it in balance, keep it healthy, keep it functioning? And that means looking at a lot of nitty gritty stuff that is inconvenient, frankly, uh, to all the users out there on public lands. Mm -hmm. um, we need to have healthy soil crusts, which bore the heck out of a lot of people, um, but, <laughs> not, <laughs> but <Aaron>. not Christian. <laughs> I love talking about soil biomes. That's why next question was going to be. When you talk about balancing the ecosystem, when you talk yeah. about the role that these animals play in grazing and the carbon capture of growing these plants and the, and the soil biome, that's really interesting. And I think that's in, the world is talking about that right now because Netflix mm -hmm. has Kissed the Ground, which is our friend Ian Summerholder's yeah. uh, documentary. And I think it speaks to what it is you guys are doing when you talk about balancing an ecosystem. So I think it's necessary. Keep going. My point is keep going. All right, I'll keep going with those soils. <laughs> I wish I actually knew more about soils, but when we're looking at all of those things- Wait, 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 wait. interjection, interjection. We are doing a um, workshop here uh, uh, with the savory method. So that does talk about managing soil. So if anybody's interested in that, let me know. We're gonna be- I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, keep going, Celeste. Um, 
So when we're looking at all, all of these uses in that the health and functionality of that land, that means taking into account um, the, the plant structures and communities. Uh, so you might look out over our public lands and see broad swaths of green growing forage looking plants, but really looking at what's there, is that a community of plants that is native? Is that a community of plants that took over because of invasive seeds? Is that a community of plants that's responding to some catastrophic environmental event uh, for good or for bad? Um, so, and then looking at those riparian systems that are real small slivers on our vast expanses of land that we have out there, but all of life is uh, reliant upon really narrow bands of um, really delicate ecosystems. So that's me backing up to then say, we've sort of relegated wild horses to lands that are fragile. Um, that's where we have said, okay, we'll manage you here. Um, and, and so that adds another layer of being tricky uh, to what we've got out there. And then we've said, oh, hey, we're gonna manage you alongside cattle grazing. Well, species that are managed for grazing are always gonna compete with each other. And I'm not gonna lay down any blanket statement about who's better. Um, it, it is what it is. And then we've got to take into account that by law uh, and by our cultural history, uh, there is going to be, you know, um, commercialized grazing on our public lands. There just is. Um, can we equalize that? I'm going to try to think about equalizing that in an ecologic fashion. Uh, so how can we graze these animals together uh, within the context of everything else that's happening out there? Um, and this, I'm wrapping around to fertility control here, Wendy. Um, we have gotten to a point because horses have an amazing reproductive growth rate. So, you know, they are, they have a high reproductive success. Uh, in biology, we think about your reproductive success being that you have had offspring and then your offspring have offspring and their offspring have offspring. Horses do a fantastic job of doing this. <laughs> they are long lived and they, uh, they have a low mortality rate. Uh, they are hardy and they have a foal practically every year, practically their whole life. That, that was how they evolved to survive under sets of circumstances that were different than today, obviously. There were predators picking off foals a heck of a lot more than they do now. There were, there were bigger landscapes these horses were grazing across. Uh, there was more um, you know, extreme events that are gonna take down some of those populations. Um, mm. And now we have horses relegated to certain areas with fencing uh, water that's accessible on private land around that fencing that is shared also with cattle. Mm. Uh, and we have traffic and we have, you know, relatively speaking, barely any predators. So those horses are just doing what they do and maintaining that same thing that they do, which is to reproduce really easily. Now compound that with a management paradigm that says, oh my gosh, when the horses are sort of above the numbers that we see, this, uh, this herd management area can handle, we're gonna gather up the excess and remove them so that we leave behind a number that we consider appropriate. But then what you've done is you very quickly reduced a population. And frankly, everyone's looking around and going, wow, my resources are no longer limited. My reproductive growth rate is now actually going to go up. So in essence, what we're doing is we're not only spinning around and around chasing our tails, we're making the problem even more complicated. So we like to say that the problem on the range is reproduction. If you're not going to address reproduction, you will continue to chase your tail. So we can continue to say, oh my gosh, there's too many horses out here, we need to round them up. But whoever's left behind is gonna continue to reproduce. And now our numbers are, are so high 
And, and I don't mean so high in a judgment call. I just mean so high in terms of the resources we have to be able to handle managing them. Um, that beginning to think about how we apply fertility control to slow down reproduction um, is really daunting. Um, and the way that that has to happen, unfortunately, now today, it would be amazing if we could just go out and and deliver a safe, humane, immunocontraceptive vaccine to 80, 90% of the mares that are out there. Um, that'd be great, but it, it wouldn't work fast enough, um, even if you could magically apply it to everybody. Um, they're still, their numbers will still grow for a while before they level off. And it's very difficult to use fertility control at these numbers to then drop populations. And what we will see in the meantime is the habitat becoming even more difficult for those horses that we care about to live on. Um, so we are doing ourselves a huge disservice to not immediately begin layering in and then scaling up fertility control. We can't do it overnight immediately to everybody, but we can begin to apply fertility control alongside these gathers. Um, for a little while until we, we sort of reach that compensation point where we can then drop off and almost eliminate gathers completely. But they have to work kind of like this. And, and that's not a happy place to be. Nobody wants that to be the way that it has to happen. But that is the way that we could get to a point where fertility control was the driving management tool on our public lands for wild horses. Instead of instead of capture and removal. Right. So, but what you're saying is we have to live with the reality that roundups are gonna be a part of this for the foreseeable future until you can flatten the that sort of curve. It's kind of like talking about coronavirus, like you have to flatten the curve and, and eventually get the numbers down to where it is manageable. Can you foresee a day though, if, can you foresee a time when you could manage viable numbers on the range? Is that, is that a realistic hope? It is, and I, I don't mean to make, uh, you know, the use of fertility control sound like, oh my gosh, it's such a reach, we're never gonna get there. I think that um, because of, uh, I think we're gonna get into this a little bit down the line when we talk about collaboration, but because of, uh, more parties being amenable to listening to how fertility control could be utilized, we are in better shape um, than we had been maybe, I don't know, even, even five or six years ago. Um, there's been a lot of sort of re-education about how fertility control can be useful that, that, um, that is beginning to happen now. Um, because I think when we have such competing interests in any issue, as we are seeing over and over again, uh, everyone shuts down and quits listening uh, when there's really good information, but, but that information has to be a back and forth. Um, so we're learning how to speak differently about fertility control and how it can be applied and what's a, real, a realistic expectation of how it can be applied. And while I would say Return to Freedom has always wanted fertility control to be the way in which we manage wild horses, and we've wished and hoped and hoped and hoped that that is all we would need to do. Um, when we actually look at how population ecology functions right now, that's not attainable without a, a little bit of a slower scaling up of fertility control. Uh, and Wendy, as you were saying, sort of alongside those gathers. And that sounds horrific to say, but it is how we would get to a place where then we could do that. It is how we would get to a place where we wouldn't ever have to warehouse horses in long-term holding. Of course, everything scales up and is really big and atrocious sounding in the beginning, but it gets us to a place that is um, a lot more ethical, um, a lot more having horses on our landscape, a healthier landscape with healthier horses around all those other things that are happening. And, and we also have to think about that we're talking today primarily about horses that are just on Bureau of Land Management land, but there are horses on Forest Service lands, private lands, 
National Park Service lands, tribal lands. Um, so it's not like the, the issue is confined to this one box. Right, um, right. And unless we are addressing that population growth rate, uh, the box will get bigger and bigger. I think, I think you know, what, what's so tricky is, is anyone who's been exposed to these animals um, sort of develops a love affair with them. It's hard not to. I mean, I know there are those out there who would call them vermin and see them as, as uh, <laughs> taking away land that they'd like to use for, uh, for profit. And, and I, I see that we are so split on this, this issue too. But to separate the emotional investment in this and listen to the science of it, it sort of helps you see the holistic problem that we're dealing with here and that it isn't any one part of this pie. It's like every, every single interest in our public lands and, and, and forest service and, and, and all the lands that you're talking about where wild horses live, we do have to be conscious of the fact that they're not all ours. And as much as we would love to have just wild horses roaming free wherever they wanna be, that we have to also honor the fact that the earth can only give us so much and we have to figure out a way to be sustainable. So I guess I'm, you sort of sound like you are hopeful that we can come together around this if we approach it from, from a calm and scientific and marrying that with the ethics of it and, and the, the passion that a lot of us have. If it's based in science, there is hope that we can come together around this issue. I, I, I think, I mean, Netta, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, I've been involved with Return to Freedom and this issue since 2005. And, and I would say that in the past couple of years, there has been a shift um, to uh, this um, maybe uncomfortable at first, but in true, I mean, I know it sounds totally cliche, but in working across the aisle and together with disparate voices and what we're learning from that exercise, which, which has been painful and we, <clears throat> we get attacked for it. Everybody get a, gets attacked anytime you go and meet with the, you know, perceived other side. And, and I think we deeply understand that, but unless you're willing to understand truly what the concerns are from all the stakeholders, instead of assigning what you think the concerns are. Um, mm. It is a really important process. And I think because of that, because of the people who have been willing and organizations who have been willing to stick their necks out and say, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna take the hits, but we're gonna talk about this together. Um, we have learned where there is common ground. We have learned that we have perhaps miscommunicated uh, about fertility control, both how it operates and how it can be used. So we've learned to do that better. Um, I mean, we've just learned yeah. lesson after lesson after lesson. And that's been helpful to, uh, to push the conversation forward instead of the same sort of bashing back and forth in the same place all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, if, if we had to ask, um, what, why should Americans care about wild horses? I mean, what do, what do you think is their added value to, to this, this world? How Who's going first, question? Netta? Me or you? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, it's a really good question because it's kind of the question we've asked for 25 years. How do we engage the public to care when they're struggling to pay rent, when they're living in urban areas, et cetera? Um, you know, for me, obviously, this is a battle over, you know, our public lands. Our taxes are paying for these cows out there and the livestock out there. So it becomes that, you know, I became an activist first. And then I realized that, you know, activism sometimes and, and advocacy has done a disservice to the to the horses and to our followers because it's based on emotion and and where the world is right now, we need science. And if you're going to need science, you better listen to the science because, you know, I'd rather listen to my heart, but the science is telling me, you know, but then within that, I think I'm a solution focused person. So I'm always looking for the solution. I know it's out there. When you will take, when you go out in nature, you see an herb, you know, if you have an ailment, you know, um, you have one herb that's gonna grow near another herb that complements 
each other. And there's always like, you know, there's the remedy next to the poison. So you've got, I, there is a solution and people need to understand the science so we can come up with solutions. And today, what's happening with conservation globally is that unlikely partners are coming together, uh, people with different agendas, people with different um, expertise, people that don't agree with each other are coming together to find solutions. And I really truly believe that is the only way we're gonna solve problems globally. And I think the horse is a species that just is so romantic and mystical that I think to do right by not only the horse, but all large mammals who are definitely on the front lines of, you know, they're, they're facing what we, we don't realize it, but we're next. And so for me to do what's right by these horses is going to kind of reset our priorities, I think, in a much more on the moral high ground. And I, I care about animals that I may never see. I'd love to know that they're out there. I love that the rainforest is there. I love that Borneo is there. I want, you know, all these things matter. Everything matters. And so I think that's why, you know, for me, the horse is the misfit. The wild horse in America, the American Mustang is the mis misfit and they represent me, you know, and I want, you know, they represent me out there. So I think, I don't know if I've answered your question, but I do think that that's, that's why I care, you know, I'm gonna fight for them. And I do think to answer Celeste, before I do think things are shifting, they shift slowly, the worm turns slowly, um, but it is shifting. And it is because we have gone, put our necks out, not just us, but various people that are conservation minded to sit down with, I call it, you know, meetings with the dark side, but you know, you're sitting down because the other stakeholders have a legal right to be there. So whether we like it or not, whether we agree with uh, the population target goals that be, the Bureau of Land Management is set for the wild horses or not. They have the legal right to do that. So uh, the, it's tough. It's a, it's a multiple use management agenda out there on our public lands and the horses are outnumbered, sure, certainly by privately owned livestock. And we can get uh, really upset, and I do, about that politically. Um, but when we're looking at what everyone is facing globally and what's, and even just in our country on these arid, delicate ecosystems, this is the time for science right now is the time for science. And then to temper it with um, emotion so that you use that to find viable solutions that are non-lethal. This is exciting. This is where we are right now. We're at that table and that's exciting because this has never happened before. It has never happened before that the humane side of the United States, a wild horse conservation organization, the ASPCA is sitting down at the table um, with the Cattlemen's Association and uh, the Farm Bureau and all these things. And you know, it's not comfortable. We do not agree, but we're trying to carve out some viable solutions right now with what the horses are facing. Um, and it's a challenge, but it needs to happen. So I've answered a couple of questions in one, but I, I just wanted to say that, <laughs> but I hope it answered your Great. question. Great okay. answer. I, I, and it I speaks know, to so the complexity you. of the issue, sorry. Yeah, certainly is complex. <laughs> Celeste, sorry. <laughs> No, no, I that well, and that complexity is, I think, part of how how I would answer, which is very similar to Netta, but that there's a lot that if we're not listening, really listening, uh, we're missing, um, and that includes listening to all the stakeholders and all the uses on public lands and the science around that. And sometimes what we hear, we don't like personally, and digging into what those reasons are for our personal dislike for it and deciding if that's something we stand behind or if it's something we can kind of go around because in the long run, the outcome is better. I think that's an uncomfortable position for anybody. Um, but when we look at the horse, especially under the context of global climate change, the conditions under with which we sort of established federal protections for these animals are not the same as they were, what, almost 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we have to consider that um, those arid climates that the horses are relegated to are becoming even more so. Uh, those slivers of wetland areas and riparian zones are vanishing. Um, so it's contingent upon us to, even though that's 
a, a, a bad feeling in terms of how we think about, okay, well, then what animals and how many animals can be out there? It, you know, it's going to change, but it has to um, so that we have horses out on our public lands. Um, if everything gets to a point, and, and horses are only one part of getting to this point, all those other uses contribute to degradation of that habitat. Um, you know, unless we're willing to think about how we balance that, and that includes kind of looking at each piece of that pie, um, just shifting how one or another uh, use is managed out there isn't really going to affect the whole. Uh, so we have to get a little bit brave and talk a little bit bigger about a lot of uses on our public lands, but horses are part of that. And we have to get a little braver in talking about how horses are a part of that so that we make sure we do what's right by them. And the reason that's important is that horses are sort of this um, great opportunity to talk to people about these issues um, on our public lands and on our landscapes. We should, we should be utilizing them for that and, and it's for the greater good. Um, and then ultimately, uh, for those of us that are glad that horses are federally protected on our landscapes, it means that they too are gonna be doing a lot better. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons they're important. God, so I guess we all need to start listening more. This is so hard. <laughs> Everyone except for me. That's on my agenda. <laughs> I'm going to write that down. Listen more. How do you spell that? Um, um, but thank you, um, you guys, so much for just uh, for educating us on where we are now and where we need to be and all of the parties concerned and you know, this whole holistic approach to how we move forward in the environment is, um, I think now more than ever, everyone sees yeah. it firsthand. It's like, no longer can you say, well, that's something that's happening over there. We're all going through right. it. Wherever it's we're happening there. right here. Yeah, it's happening right here. And, you know, in a way, that's the wake up call that maybe we all needed. And hopefully, we will be able to get better at reaching across the aisle and sitting down with what we may consider the... <laughs> darker side <laughs> Dark. <laughs> they think of us sometimes yeah. um, i think they do <laughs> but without without coming together and finding some sort of of way forward then we're all doomed to fail so that's the big lesson in all of this and maybe horses can help us get there mm. and you're right Absolutely. when you say that that's you out there the 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 existential crisis that we have as a species is how is this sustainable how we're treating mm -hmm. the planet and when you look at the necessity of communication and science um, alongside with the emotion of it, um, to sit down with the other side and say, these horses are a version of us in the future. And if we can't figure out how this game works with them, we're not gonna be able to do it for ourselves. Which mm -hmm. means we go back to science and we say, how do we make this work? And I, and I think that's a perfect example of what Celeste talked about so well um, which is the juggling of science, um, emotion, uh, and the practical application of how to make this work for everybody. And that is mm -hmm. us. Those horses are us. And I mm -hmm. think one of the things that, to pivot quickly, that I love so much about these talks is until I, you know, until we had this conversation, I didn't know they existed. And one mm -hmm. of my favorite quotes that I use all the time in storytelling is from Toni Morrison, uh, it's Song of Solomon, and there's this great character called Pilot Dread, and she's, she's um, incredibly old at this point, and she's peeling an orange on the front porch of her steps, and she's talking about her life. And she says, I wish I would have known more, because if I would have known more people, I would have loved more. And I think mm. that's an indication of this, is that I didn't know these creatures existed. And now understanding um, the intricate role that they play, um, and also as a representation of ourselves, that now that we know, we love. And that's the purpose of, of education. That's the purpose of these talks is mm -hmm. to, to bring these issues to light and be able to figure out a solution to solve it for, for the future of everybody. So what a wonderful conversation. Thank you guys for having it. Yeah, and, for, and if anybody wants to know how to help, um, they should go to returntofreedom.org and get more information on this amazing work that these women are doing.